Um, I would like to just um, welcome uh, Vice President of World Chefs, uh, Martin Kobold, who's joining us from Austria today, although normally you reside in South Africa, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Excellent. So I'm going to hand it over to you, and then uh, I will uh, pick it up in a little bit. We'll start interviewing Chef Martin. So, Chef Martin, welcome. Hey, thank you. Coffee. Thank you, Chris. Now I drink coffee. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, much appreciated. First of all, first and foremost, uh, thank you very much to you, Chris, uh, for hosting again, uh, which will be of no doubt a very successful seminar today uh, for Feed the Planet and obviously all the sustainability progress, uh, programs for World Chefs. So thank you, Chris, on behalf of the Board of Directors. We're truly honored to have you with us and, uh, and can share, really can share your knowledge uh, to the rest of the world. And I think this COVID-19 as you mentioned earlier, I think it's a great opportunity now with the social media or the, the media, what, what, do you, what do you call it, that the Zoom seminars would be due. I think it's become becomes such a norm. And um, I think it's fantastic because we can just reach so much more people. Uh, we wouldn't have dreamt of doing this before COVID-19. So there's always something positive out of a negative. So that's fantastic. So thank you, Chris. Uh, but uh, Chef Mark Cerise, a um, uh, very warm welcome to you. And uh, Mark, Mark Schuess is, is the, currently the Vice President of Global Culinary and Griffiths Food. So, oh, am I gone away? I don't know. No, something, no, you're here. Still there. Something happened on my screen. Sorry about that. Um, so, obviously, with Mark, um, with uh, culinary, uh, global culinary uh, and custom culinary and Griffiths, obviously, being the holding company, being a great supporter for many, many years already about World Chefs on and off. Uh, so we're very excited to have you back and have you specifically on our seminar today. So on behalf of the board of directors of World Chefs, um, a sincere thank you for helping us and being part of this whole, whole scenario today. So um, we're very honored to have you on there and, uh, and looking forward for you sharing your knowledge, your vision for sustainability, which I know is a big aim in your life and um, for all the things you've done. I mean, just to mention a few things, uh, I know you're a native from New Orleans and Mark was heavily influenced by Cajun and cereal cuisine. And, um, you know, I've got a couple of notes here, which I'm just reading off you now, if you don't mind, Mark, uh, but <laughs> I'd like to share it with all our audience, which I think it's, it's important for everybody to know who they got in front of them, in front of their screens. So, you know, he was spent 35 years cooking with the food industry with the roles of the chef, chef de cuisine and the corporate executive chef for the Brennan's restaurants in New Orleans. So, you know, and is, 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 is a member of numerous various associations around the world, but of course, also a member of, of World Chefs, which we're very proud of. So Mark, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to hear much more from you. And um, at that stage, I would like to hand over to Chris again, in case I've forgotten something, but I'm sure Chris, you will come up with a lot of exciting questions. A lot of things you can draw out of Mark and uh, to the benefit of our members. So thank you, team. I really appreciate it. But last but not least, as to Lynn, a great thank you from my side. Uh, you're doing a fantastic job uh, to bring all the seminars on. I've been introducing it in various uh, platforms already, and Lynn is doing a great job. So thank you, Lynn, from the Office of World Chefs. Uh, she's always hiding in the background, but she's doing a great job. So thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. And welcome to all the members. Uh, to, to that seminar and um, keep your ears open and learn, learn, learn. That's all you can do today is just learn and take the knowledge home, uh, what, you, what you get today. So thank you guys, appreciate it. Thank you for the warm welcome, Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we were, the three of us talking before you all joined us and, and Lynn is like Charlie and Charlie's angel. She's, she's <laughs> hidden and, and we are the three angels dressed in white chef coats, which probably <laughs> is a stretch. But anyways, <laughs> so Mark, um, first of all, you know, a huge welcome. Um, you know, you are, you know, a sustainability champion. Uh, you and I have talked uh, before and I was, I was so impressed when we had lunch, I don't know, before pre-COVID and, and talked about what you're doing at, at Griffith. But before we get to that, you grew up in New Orleans and I just, I have to, because we have the whole world here and New Orleans is like one of the greatest food cities, um, certainly in the United States and one in the world. So I just want to ask you briefly, you know, what was it like growing up in New Orleans and, and what's your favorite food there? <laughs> um, uh, 
growing up in New Orleans was wonderful. Uh, there's a, a Joe de Vie in New Orleans and, and all of South Louisiana um, that I think is unmatched almost anywhere in the world. And uh, that joy of life is expressed through the sharing of food. Um, at breakfast, we talk about what we're doing for lunch. And at lunch, what are we doing for dinner? And we plan everything around the seasons and what's available and the dishes that are associated with that. Um, so it, it, was, it was wonderful growing up there. My, my father being of Cajun descent, my mother who grew up in New Orleans, I got the best of both of those cuisines. And although they're interrelated, they're very different. Um, so in terms of a favorite dish, this I is think impossible. Uh, yeah, it's hard <laughs> to pick, but I think my favorite dish is, the, is really a dish of love. Um, and that is uh, crawfish bisque uh, or bisque babies. And what that is, is not your traditional French style crawfish bisque, uh, but it's a hearty crawfish stew in which the heads of the crawfish are carefully cleaned with a toothbrush and stuffed with a farci and then simmered into this really rich uh, gravy. Um, it takes hours and hours and hours to prepare and all the cleaning. And usually it's a family affair. Um, it's not work done by one person. Um, you often don't see it in restaurants because it can't be duplicated. Um, it's done in the homes. And, um, you know, it's the first thing that's pulled out when there's a hurricane or, uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> the power's out and uh, it's pulled out and saved. So more people cried in Katrina over their crawfish <laughs> Just lost than anything else. I love it. I I haven't had that. I'll th I will have to hit you up for that. So so, chef, tell me a little bit about your sustainability journey. You know, I mean, none of us were necessarily born into this world of sustainability. Especially, you know, you've been in the business thirty some years. You know, it wasn't something we talked about. Or how did this happen for you? Was there a moment when you kind of said, gee, this is really something I need to pay attention to? Were there milestones along the way? How did that happen for you? I think just being a chef uh, and the idea of being conscious of what we're serving and, and how we're respecting the ingredients has always been in line with that sustainability. Uh, whether you were supporting local fishermen that were, were practicing or whether you were conserving uh, waste and limiting um, you know, the amount that, that's thrown away, um, certainly was part of any restaurant owner or any management of a restaurant. So although we didn't think about it as terms of sustainability, we certainly thought about it as you know, a way to minimize impact. And whether that was impact on the restaurant, impact on your city, or impact on the globe, that journey has always been there. And um, as I've, I've moved through my career um, and, you know, learned a little more about the rest of this wonderful globe, um, that how important it is to preserve that. Um, as I got into Griffith Foods, um, it's part of our purpose. Um, so our purpose is to blend care and creativity to nourish the world. And part of that is being sustainable. Um, and there's many aspects to that, and there's many ways to be sustainable, but it's at the core of our purpose of our company and our family of companies. All right. So, so it's really been inbred in you from the very beginning. I think so. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a little bit like, you know, in, in well-run restaurants, we always look at things like food waste and, you know, all Absolutely. of that. Um, so you mentioned Griffith, and, and obviously Griffith was, was mentioned in your introduction. You know, at Griffith, you manage 48 chefs around the world. You're responsible for culinary strategy, on and on and on. It's a big responsibility. But just for everybody here who maybe is kind of saying, now wait, who is, who is Griffith Foods exactly? And, you know, maybe they've heard them through, you know, custom culinary in World Chefs. Can you just fill us in a little bit about Griffith? Griffith Foods is a product development company that supports the, the larger food industry. Uh, we have a family of companies, Custom Culinary being um, our largest, um, that supports food service. So um, Griffith Foods is more industrial, 
but we also have a flavor company called Innova Flavors um, that does some of the, the flavor and product development work. And we also have a company called Tarova, um, which is sustainably sourced ingredients and spices. Um, so it's a family of companies, um, and we have plenty of joint ventures around the globe as well um, in many different countries. So today we're talking about sourcing in particular. And, you know, again, there's so many different facets of, of sustainability. But let's focus on sourcing today. Let's, you know, you work for a, a large company. Griffith is not a small company. Uh, it's a large company with you know, a real commitment to sustainability. But tell me a little bit about what does sustainable sourcing mean to you? What does it mean to Griffith? Well, um, sustainable sourcing is, is, a, is a term that's thrown out there quite readily. And any sustainability effort, well, in fact, has to be sustainable. Um, you know, of course, that any company, any restaurant is there to make some type of, of profit. And, and in order for sustainability efforts to continue, it has to make business sense. So, um, you know, it's got to be a little bit of evolving. It has to feed upon itself to continue that sustainability efforts. And to give you an example, if I can. Absolutely. Uh, um, uh, we uh, work with farmers very closely in India uh, for chilies. And we started this um, kind of sustainability for first and foremost for traceability. So we really wanted to be, uh, you know, be able to trace our products to ensure quality. Um, but as we got into it, we realized that, that we can provide something to the farmers. If we can provide better growing conditions, um, helping them have better farming practices, um, their yields will increase. And if their yields increase and their quality increases, we reap the benefit of that. So um, that was the first step in it. Um, the, the second step is that as we're evolving these farmers, we're eliminating some of the middlemen within that, the, uh, the, the, the food chain. Um, and by doing so, we're able to pay these farmers at a much higher wage and for their products, for their, their, their hard work, than they could in the open market because we're dealing directly with them. So by doing so, uh, we reap the benefit of quality, traceability, and the farmers get a much better wage. So to add to that is that, well, what else can we do for those farmers? And so we've invested money into providing fresh, clean water for their communities. We've provided uh, help and, and education uh, for the farmers' families. So what happens is, is more farmers want to be part of this system. So we grow more farmers. We get more people involved in it. We invest into the communities. We, we get higher quality and traceability. And so, and therefore, we can pass that on to our customers. So it becomes cyclical. So as we invest more in farmers, the farmers grow more products, we get better, better traceability. We help feed into the communities. The communities then um, empower us to go out and do more sustainable efforts with other ingredients such as sage, black pepper, um, cinnamon, turmeric, everything else. And as this picks up, we're doing this in communities around the globe. So we're impacting the farmer. And just like any farm to table movement, knowing your farmer is, is key to in the cornerstone of that. And that's exactly what we're doing on a global scale. But do you then also get to work directly with a farmer and say, you know, I'd really like you to raise it in the most sustainable way in terms of you know, Absolutely. Part of, the, you know. part of those farming practices is teaching them how to raise those products in, sustain, in a very sustainable way, how to minimize the use of overwatering, how to minimize the use of anything that's added to the soil, how to get the most yields out of their crops um, with the least amount of waste. 
So that's built into working with the farmers. And we have teams of people on the ground that are working directly day to day with the farmers, uh, monitoring their fields and ensuring that everybody is working together. Not only that, but we're also asking the farmers who have been doing this for generations, their input. So it's a very collaborative effort in terms of growing the highest possible yield with the least amount of natural resources um, for the greatest amount of traceability, yield, and impact to the environment, as well as families. This sounds, <coughs> it sounds a little bit like win, win, win <coughs> all the way around. You get traceability, you get a better product there. The farmer is, is, is supported, uh, makes more money, and mm -hmm. you have the ability to, to kind of dictate how stuff is grown in a sustainable way. Absolutely. And not only is it the farm that's impacted, it's also their communities in which they live. So they're also impacted by, you know, the efforts of these farmers and whole communities are building upon that with the land. So we're taking land that has traditionally been either over farmed, uh, um, over irrigated or over um, chemical um, dependent. And we're transforming that soil into something that's much more sustainable and in some cases, completely organic. Okay, so I'm gonna play total devil's advocate here because you'll talk to other uh, businesses who will say, look, it's really not my job or responsibility to do all that work. You know, you've got a team on the ground, you're, you're spending hours, days, weeks with these people around the world. Um, and some businesses would argue that that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to get the cheapest product for the cheapest amount of money to maximize you know, corporate profit uh, because that is what we do. How would right. you answer that? Because it well, comes down to profitability. Well, first of all, to, to the first part of your question, how can we afford not to do this? So this is a social responsibility of any company is, is to, to obtain that. Um, secondly is um, it's a shared value. And so if our purpose is to nourish the world, um, it's beyond just trying to provide charity and feeding people. It's to help enable people to have better wages, to have a better environment. And as, as a company, how can we not support um, the bigger picture of an overall much more sustainable world. Um, that if we want to have longevity in terms of a company, we have to look beyond profits. Um, yes, we have to be profitable because we're, we're a business and in order to sustain our business, there needs to be profits. But really the long-term success and the long-term growth of any company has to be years and years out. And the only way we can do that is to source things sustainably, provide to the environment, provide to the people for that triple bottom line of people, planet, and performance. Um, and all of those things come together in, in a circular fashion to help propagate and increase more of those sustainable, sustainable practices again and again and again all over the world. I, I love that. And I, and I love the explanation because, you know, when we were talking through that curriculum, one of the things that I kept coming back to, which is a tenant of sustainability, is long-term vision. You know, if we're just thinking about today, tomorrow, the next month, we tend not to make sustainable decisions. When we look into the future and we say, you know, the decision I'm making now has an impact that may last for years. And I, I appreciate you saying that because I think that is something for all of us to keep in mind. It is about the long-term vision of, of whatever we do. So I mean, this, is, this is so fascinating. And you know, on the curriculum, we also didn't spend much time talking about the social aspects of sustainability, which is a really important thing. And, and you've, I think, spoken very eloquently about, you know, not just, you know, growing stuff in a sustainable way, but, you know, supporting, uh, a, you know, the farmer and by doing so the community, et cetera, et cetera. And that yeah. ensures then you have great product for well, years. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's the, the benefit of it. Um, but really we're enabling people. 
And we're enabling people not only with knowledge, but we're enabling people with better lives. And, you know, if you have a better life, you're going to be more committed into doing the best possible job that you can. Um, and these farmers want to work with us. They want to learn these practices. They want to increase their yields. They want to reduce the amount of waste um, and, and get a fairer wage for their hard work. Why, why wouldn't that? So it is a shared value. Everybody does win. Um, okay. And with that, um, you know, the world wins. Quick question. Then we're going to get to some other questions here. Um, so I'm a chef, I'm somewhere in the world, I'm not dealing with Griffith, I'm dealing with, or custom culinary, I'm, you know, somebody else. How do I know if the people I'm dealing with are sourcing in a sustainable manner? That's a loaded question, but- how That is a loaded question. Um, <laughs> know, know your farmer. Um, if you're, you are a chef in a restaurant, um, knowing where your product's coming from, knowing the farmer, knowing the person who took the time and effort to to nurture something out of the ground, um, to understand what their philosophy is about growing and the care they have for the earth. Because I don't think there's any farmer out there that, that says, I'm gonna go out there and destroy this piece of ground so I can't grow any more products. They're nurturing that earth and they're nurturing those plants that come out of it. And it's their fruits of their labor, literally. Um, so know the farmer. Uh, understand where your products are coming from, know the traceability, even at the restaurant level. Excellent. Um, all right, I'm, so I'm just looking at some of the, the questions here. Let me ask you also, is there, are there third party people, you know, organizations that, that certify that sourcing is being done well? I mean, you know, in other words, me as a chef, I could go to their website and they could certify that these are the people who are, you know, really well, good. Um, you know, Rainforest Alliance is one of them. Um, but Rainforest Alliance covers a whole depth and breadth of, uh, of companies. When we first started this journey, um, there was no uh, sustainably sourced governing body um, for spices. Um, so we worked with the Rainforest Alliance to create the criteria for what it means to have sustainably sourced spices, much like coffee or chocolate. So we created that. So we partnered with Rainforest Alliance um, to set up the determining factors of what it means to have a sustainably sourced spice or herb. Excellent. All right, question here. Um, so would, 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 all of the additional items like you're talking about, you know, team on the ground, all the efforts you're doing, et cetera, would that not also increase the cost to the end user? Um, well, because we've eliminated several of the middlemen along the, along the path. So if you have somebody that's selling chilies, they sell it to a local middleman who sells it to another middleman. We eliminate all of that and we work directly with the farmers. So we are getting the product, although not at the, as cheap as we could possibly get it, we're certainly getting it at, at a good cost. And that profit that we make from that good cost is, can be taken and invested in other sustainable efforts. So it's not profit for profit's sake, it's profit right. with a mission. Excellent. Keep the questions coming in here, guys. We have a few minutes. Uh, you have, by the way, an, an open invitation to go to Pakistan. <laughs> All right. I'd love to. Uh, and, I've never and been to Pakistan. <laughs> I, I, I haven't either, and I've been to a lot of places, but it's really interesting that the comment here is, you know, we really need the kind of guidance you're talking about in Pakistan uh, because it is an agricultural country. You know, food yeah. is one of the biggest parts of, of their culture, um, you know, spices, herbs, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah. You have uh, you have an open invitation to go to to Pakistan and and awesome. apply your 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 wisdom there. There's also an interesting question here, and I'm not. It doesn't necessarily pertain to sourcing, although I guess it sort of does. And it's really so. The the question is, how does one serve global cuisines um, in their you know restaurant and wow. still be local and sustainable, keeping the authenticity intact, which is a really interesting you know, sort of tension, right? I mean, if, if I'm in Ecuador serving Italian cuisine, or if I'm in Mexico serving, 
Malaysian food. Uh, how, how, how do I do that and still keep it real and local? Well, well first of all, if, if, to use your local availability for the interpretation of that cuisine. That works for most of it. So if you're doing Italian cuisine, you know, locally grown tomatoes, um, locally grown uh, or, uh, fresh herbs. But when you're talking about ingredients that you can't get locally, let's say cinnamon, um, and you're in, I don't know, you're in Europe, they don't grow cinnamon in Europe. So how do you keep that, uh, you know, farm to table kind of thing going? Um, really, it's about knowing where you're getting your products from and how those products are harvested. So there is bad practices out there about removing and stripping the bark off of this, uh, the cinnamon tree, and there's good practices. Um, seeking out those purveyors of high quality um, ecological um, producers is a way to at least ensure that whatever country your raw materials are coming from uh, are sourced correctly in that country. So, um, Although you can't get so local with some of these ingredients, the due diligence to understand where these products are coming from and who is, who is uh, harvesting these products and how they're being harvested. And there's a plethora of information on the internet, especially about companies. So even Excellent. if they're not dealing with a group of foods, they can certainly understand where the sources are. Well, and I also think that, that, you know, when you go local like that, you know, and when you're making international cuisine, but using local ingredients, there will be some differences. It I mean, it's just, you know, the nature of the beast. Um, all right, fast answer to a difficult question because we're run, running short on time here. What do you think, <laughs> what do you think the next sustainable trends will be internationally? Um, In 30 seconds. <laughs> I, I, and the long and short of it is seafood. Um, by 2050, there may no longer be commercial fishing because um, we've depleted the waters um, so or have harmed them greatly. So I think the ability to not only sustain, um, you know, ecological fishing practices, I think it'll be the responsibility of chefs to determine how best to use the whole entire product from seafood, um, how to preserve that. And cultures have been doing this for centuries, how to get the most out of seafood, whether it's fish sauces or, or fermentation. Um, I think much more exploration, uh, exploration will occur, but I think it's going to be the center of the next sustainable type of ingredient is how, what do we do with seafood and how do we approach it and how do we preserve this wonderful um, cornerstone of, 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 of being a chef? Very good. Uh, now, I know that there are a number of additional questions I see coming in right now, but we are pretty much out of time. Uh, Lynn, if we can capture these questions, I'm gonna send a couple to you, Chef Mark, if you don't mind sure. just responding digitally. Uh, right. There's some really <laughs> good ones here. There's also a number of questions about um, becoming a trainer about uh, uh, maybe doing another world, you know, World Chef Sustainability Seminar. Uh, stay tuned for all of that. Uh, we will, uh, we'll let you know. Um, Chef Mark, I have just, as we wrap up here, two quick pieces of advice uh, to two separate groups of people. If you, I'm gonna ask for your wisdom here. The first is, and I know that a lot of the, the Griffith chefs have become trainers of the sustainability curriculum, yeah. along with a lot of other people now around the world. And they're just getting going on this. So the first question I have for you is a piece of advice for those people going out and, and that will be teaching the, the, the curriculum. And secondly, just, I guess, an overall piece of advice that you would have for the chefs on the line all the way down to culinary students and you know the cooks, everybody in the middle. Cause there's a lot of people here from a lot of different backgrounds. And if you were just to give sort of your piece of advice about how to, how to be a sustainable chef, um, what would that be? So kind of those two groups of people, if you don't mind. Um, I, I think that 
you know, as a chef, uh, you were stewards of these raw materials. And being a good steward is just being sustainable. And in every effort that you make, no matter how small, it's something that you can do as an individual. And it's something that you can do with it as a restaurant. If everybody does that, the impact is immense. So don't think, well, I'm just one person. Yes, you are one person and you can do what you can do. And collectively, there is an impact uh, of sustainability around the globe. Uh, we have 300 people on this call. If each one of us did one sustainable act um, to help preserve the environment, to help revert, uh, preserve the climate, um, that's 300 people. Imagine that six, seven, eight times greater if everybody does that. You know, the food industry is one of the largest industries in the world because um, people need to eat. We have the potential collectively to make that impact. Hopefully that answered your question. It does. Uh, Word of advice for the trainers. Uh, for the trainers, um, you know, continue to spread the idea of how important this is. As we get busy in our day-to-day -day lives in restaurants and in kitchens, we often lose sight of that. Um, keeping that perpetual thought in your head about, am I doing full respect to an individual product? Am I using my uh, resources in the most efficient and best way to preserve the bigger picture of the world? If that gets ingrained into your head, just like your mise en place, um, it becomes daily. It becomes um, zen-like in terms of this is the way I operate. This is the way I live. This is my uh, respect back to the world that provides me with a living. That's great. Well, Chef Mark, I want to thank you uh, for taking the thank time. You. you know, it's it's interesting. You speak of individual responsibility. And it is true that each one of us has an individual responsibility. But I also just would like to call attention as we wrap this up to you know, sometimes that individual responsibility has has massive repercussions. And, you know, as all of us move up in our careers, we get more responsibility. And as we get more responsibility, we have an opportunity to make a bigger impact. And, you know, Mark, I look at what you're doing in, in Griffith, and I, and I think about, you know, here's a really big company that's really committed to doing the right thing. And the net result is that you really move the ball forward in a very substantial way. I mean, big business can make big and very positive changes. And I just, I want to thank you and, and obviously everything that you're doing at Griffith um, and, you know, to, to make these big changes. And thank you for, for getting up early and okay. having a chef jacket on by 630 in the morning. Look at you and you look fresh and awake. <laughs> so Anyways, a huge thank you to you and a huge thank you uh, to Lynn, of course, who's making this all happen, uh, Martin for joining us, and really for all of you who are joining us from, from you know, all the way from the west coast of, of Canada to Australia and everywhere in the middle, thank you for taking the time. Um, we so appreciate it. We'll be back in about three weeks with another person. We've got some great people lined up to be our next speakers, and I so look forward to seeing on my comment side of the my chat side over here all of you from all over the world joining us uh tell all your friends to join as well next time and uh, have a lovely morning afternoon and some of you finish the glass of wine and go to sleep now thank you <laughs> chef mark a million thank yous take thank care you. thank you appreciate it bye-bye right. everybody